Um, before we jump into our Bible study uh, this evening, uh, just a couple of announcements and then prayer requests. Um, Ralph and Sue need help this coming Sunday at 3 o'clock. So if you can help out, they have some big furniture items they need to move. So uh, big, strong men like Mark and, and others, uh, we welcome. I was bombed old. I understand. I will, we, will, we will help you out with that. So remember, 3 o'clock Sunday. Also, um, I think this has kind of gotten under the wire here. We haven't announced it a whole lot, but we do have a men's meeting scheduled for Saturday, I think. So nobody tells me wrong. Uh, but as far as I know, men's meeting uh, Saturday at 9, uh, 9 in the morning. I'd uh, love to have all the men there um, present for that. It just dawned on me, I think yesterday that we have a meeting this week, so please remember that. Um, and then uh, our VBS meeting, I just want to do a little catch-up meeting with everybody, uh, make sure everybody's good. Uh, this Sunday, immediately following morning worship, just for a couple of minutes, just so I can get updates, y'all, and you can update me uh, with any information. And then on our prayer request, uh, please continue to remember uh, Lisa's uncle Roger, uh, he's been, of course, dealing with cancer issues and they're wanting him to go back and do some more um, chemotherapy. Um, and so please pray for, for Roger and Susan. Uh, and this may be an opportunity uh, for us to reach out to them. Um, also, um, of course, we can do remember Buddy and Janine and the family and loss of Miss Helen. And then also the uh, Oak Forest Congregation in Goldsboro. Um, there have been some improvements with some of the members. Uh, we had, they, are, they had four people in the hospital. Uh, I think at least one of them have come home. But uh, one of the elders had to be moved, who was in, in care there in Goldsboro was, had to be moved to uh, Greensboro. His conditioning is, is, from what I understand, not getting better. It's getting worse. I believe he's, I don't know if he's on the ventilator yet. They do have two others that are on ventilators that are not, uh, one's improving, the other one is not. So they're just dealing with a lot there as far as the virus goes. And of course we remember, uh, do you remember Gary and Connie and their situation? Uh, anyone else? I know it's a lot, I just threw a lot at you. Carrie Ann Smith. Carrie Ann. Carrie Ann. And I had two co workers pass away. Uh, I'm sorry. A safety professional. He's only 31. Left two young kids and his wife. He's a cancer guy. He was 31. Oh, he had a, another person, uh, Daryl James. So he did Lex Wilbanks and Daryl James. If you pray for their family, please, as they jump the wall. Daryl James, and what was the first one? Lex Wilbanks. Lex Eubanks? Wheelbanks. Wheelbanks. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. If y'all wouldn't mind, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God and Father above, we thank you so much for loving us and showing us such tremendous uh, love and generosity of, of your mercy and your grace, Father, for the things you provide us on a daily basis. We thank you. But, Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus who gives us meaning in our lives, who gives us hope, uh, for overcoming the darkness of this world. We pray that you continue to bless us and be with us as we, um, as we try and serve you here in this community and in our world. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us. Please especially be with us tonight as we open your word, um, as we consider these, uh, the book of Acts and its, and its meanings and deeper meanings for our lives. Father, we pray that you'll bless us in our study. Father, please continue to uh, be with our congregation. Pray especially for those who are dealing with sickness and illness. There have been several mentioned here tonight that we ask for your help uh, upon. We know you know the situations and, and what's best in all of these. We just pray for your kind and caring hand to be upon them and upon their families and those who are, who are watching out for them. Uh, Father, for the families that are mourning loss, we mindful of them as well and, and for how difficult that is uh, 
Father, we pray for comfort uh, with them and that you'll help us to be instruments of yours in, in caring for these families and individuals. Father, we thank you so much for uh, all those present here, uh, whether in person or online. We, we pray that for each of these lives represented, that uh, you'll bless them. And Father, if they're not a child of God, a child of yours yet, uh, we pray that in some way we can touch their hearts and minds to, to help them in whatever way we can to uh, better understand your will for their lives. Father, thank you so much for Jesus again. And Father, send his name off of this prayer. Amen. All right. So as I mentioned before, um, we are in Acts uh, 23. Um, and that's where we're going to pick up tonight. I did get a new clicker. So hopefully tonight this one will work uh, as it should um, as we uh, move into our study this evening. Uh, in our last study, we discussed um, the events surrounding Paul speaking uh, again, defending himself, this time with the Sanhedrin. Um, with that, there were a couple of things I wanted to clear up about that. So number one, I apologize again. I got the wrong <laughs> priest in my mind for some odd reason. Um, uh, sorry about that. But I also wanted to clear up, uh, I'm, we were talking about how they were arguing and everything, and I, had, I said something like, um, you know, why do we get angry at people uh, who maybe teach things that are different than us? And what I meant by that was, and I got to think about it afterwards, and I better clarify what I said. Uh, what I meant there was, is this idea that we've talked about before about if we have the truth, we need to believe in the truth, and we shouldn't allow our emotions to create in us anger that we do things we shouldn't do, right, or to speak out of turn. Uh, and, and so our, our pursuit ought to always be for truth in Bible study, uh, in, in any endeavor in regard to the Word of God. Now, that's not to say if somebody's speaking false doctrine that we don't, you know, try to deal with that in the most Christian way possible. So, I don't want to leave anybody with that, that thought. <laughs> I said we shouldn't speak up when, you know, false teaching is being given. So, I want to clarify that before we move on. Any questions about last week's study? I endeavor to move further along this week. We'll see uh, how it goes, but... What we're going to try to do this evening is move on in chapter 23, verses 12 and following. Uh, and what the events that occurred after uh, Paul's defense before the Sanhedrin, uh, how they plotted to kill him, uh, verses 12 through 22. Then we're going to go into 23 through the end of the, uh, I believe the end of the chapter there. Uh, Paul is sent to Festus, the governor of uh, Caesarea. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that real briefly. Uh, Paul has his case heard uh, again for the third time, this time before Felix the governor, uh, Acts 24, 1 through 21. So that's a big chunk of that chapter. Deals with his defense uh, this time before Felix. Um, and then as we end chapter 24, Paul is held in custody um, there in Caesarea. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then next week we'll get into chapter 25. So if you will, let's go to 23, 12. And that's where we'll pick up in our study tonight. Um, in uh, 23, 12, the text tells us, uh, Luke writes, When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There uh, were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore, you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune uh, to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And when we are ready to kill him, and sorry, and we are ready to kill him, before he comes near. So you have 40 men, it doesn't identify who they are, uh, but they have made a pact, a vow to, to one another. And um, some, um, some of what I've read about this was, the belief here is, 
is that this isn't just some kind of offhand promise or vow, but uh, this vow carried weight, um, most likely, and it was probably a vow where if they didn't complete it, then whatever they were vowing to do would happen to them. And so it's, it's a death pact, if you will, uh, that they're going to kill Paul. They're very serious about this, in other words. That's the point. And so you've got these 40 men. Now, it's one thing for a pack of 40 ordinary men to make a, a vow like this. It's terrible and it's awful. But what, what do you see involved here? Well, it's not just 40 common men, but now they went to the chief priest. And, and the elders of the people, the Sanhedrin is who's getting involved here, and the Sanhedrin is, is, is coming along. You see how they're just getting further and further into, into this darkness that they're allowing to cloud their heart and mind. No way can they go to the law of Moses and justify what they're doing. Nothing they're doing would justify this. The death of Stephen, they could justify that. With, I wouldn't agree with it. But, I mean, you might see how they might try to justify it in their own mind and heart. They would try to say, well, see, he's a, he's a blasphemer and he deserves to die by stoning. But this is just outright murder. This man has not received a fair trial. This man, um, the only times they've tried to try him before the people, they've They've ended up in a brawl, and now they're conspiring to kill him. Um, now, but we remember, what did Jesus say to Paul in verse 11? I wish I'd put that on here to kind of start, but what, what did Jesus say to Paul? You have, you're going to Rome. So it's God's assurance to him. I mean, God's assurance is much more than any man, right? So if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Um, but you, you know, but you got this going on, and, and Paul's sitting there, and I wonder, if he's wondering, how is God going to take care of this? Well, Paul does find out about the incident. If we go on into verse 16, as we continue reading here, Somebody, if you don't mind, uh, help me out here and read 16 through 22. So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside, and asked privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than forty of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. So, so you see here um, the providence of God at work. Uh, one of the things sometimes we talk about is the difference between pro uh, providence of God and the miraculous hand of God. I think this, uh, this what's going on here is, is the hand of God through providence at work. There's nothing miraculous that happens. And what we don't know is how the young man heard about it, but somehow he, he, he did hear about it. And we're also given a little bit of insight, although Luke doesn't tell us his age, we're giving a little insight about how young he must be. Did you catch there where the centurion took the young man by the hand? What does that imply to you? You know, if, um, if you're going to redirect, say, Mark somewhere, 
Would it be awkward if I reached out and grabbed Mark by the hand and said, come on now, come with me, right? That's going to be awkward, right? But now if you do that same thing, say, uh, say you need Zach to go somewhere, it'd be perfectly okay for Mark to grab Zach by the hand and say, let's walk over here, right? And, and so this is probably not a teenager, it's probably a young man. I'm kind of guessing here. But, pre-teen. Yeah, preteen. Um, and, and so you've got this young man. He somehow heard this. We have no idea how. Uh, we'll also identify here uh, that he's the nephew of Paul. Now, we're not given a whole lot of insight to the family of Paul. We know a few things about him. We know that, 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 that his, his, uh, his father was a Roman. Uh, his mother was a Jew. Uh, we know a little bit about how he was raised. We've talked about that. Uh, but as far as I know, as far as his extended family goes, this is the only real information we're given other than that probably Barnabas. Oh, no. Never mind. I forget I said that. Um, the, so as far as I know, I'm trying to think back. I think this is the only family member of Paul that I can, that I can recall. Um, and, and so the young man comes to Paul. Again, he, he lets him know what's going on. And Paul, of course, will send him to the tribune. Um, and I think it says something about the tribune here that he listens to the young man. Now, a lot of times young people will say things and sometimes they get ignored, don't they? Uh, but this is pretty important information. The tribune listens to him and has Paul sent to Caesarea. Pretty big deal. I mean, think about what's required to send Paul. It's not like he can just put Paul on the horseback and say, head to Caesarea or send one soldier with him. How many, how many men is he going to send with him? We'll get into that in just a minute, but uh, it's a big company. Let's, uh, let's real quickly, we'll just go ahead and move to that. If you go down to verse 23 there, um, 23 says, And he called two centurions uh, and said, Get ready 200 soldiers and 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third, air, third hour of the night. 24, also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. So he calls two centurions, and you may remember a centurion is what? Soldier over 100. Yeah, so... Yeah, commander in the military over 100 men. So hence... You know, you see all the men he brings. Uh, but notice the numbers here. 200 soldiers, 200 men on foot. You have 70 horsemen and another 200 spearmen. This is a huge company. This isn't some uh, secret uh, Navy SEAL kind of activity going on here. This is... Um, this is a lot of military um, power here. Now, why, why do it? Why this many? Is that a little overkill to take one man to Caesarea? Why not just send? There were forty men going to kill him. Why not just send eighty? You got double, right? Make a statement. Yeah, and I, I think it's exactly right. I think it makes the statement, right? Um, you know, if you've got 40 men, they see 40, 40 soldiers or 80 soldiers, they might be like, all right, I got two, you got two. We can do this. But if you see that many soldiers, you're going to be like, okay, this is a bad idea, right? Let's forget we took that oath. I always wonder, uh, whatever happened to those men, they all starved to death. They did make a pact to, you know, not, not eat or drink until they killed him. Um, but uh, the text tells us they leave at the third hour of the night. That's about 9 p.m. So they're going under the cover of darkness. Um, and they're sending him to Caesarea. Uh, now, just real quickly here. Uh, here we are in Jer- Jerusalem. Um, Caesarea. Uh, is about 60 miles up here, Caesarea Antioch. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry, wrong place. Right here, Caesarea is right there on the coast. That's where he'll eventually uh, board a ship and leave as we get further along 
in the book back. So um, the uh, the first the the full mount of men will go all the way to Antipatrius, and that's where some of them will leave him, and then they will go on the next day to Caesarea. Um, now. The resources I looked at, there were different ideas about how far it is from Jerusalem uh, to Caesarea. One said 60, another one it was like 45 miles. I, I don't really know how far exactly, uh, but you're somewhere between 40 and 60 miles from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Um, all right. Uh, any questions about any of that so far? Yeah, and he was very quick to act. And he'll mention that in his letter he's going to send to Claudius. I mean, uh, to send to Felix, sorry. Claudius will mention how quickly he acted. Uh, but he's also seen how the Jews reacted to Paul. So he does have an, an, an inkling of understanding you know, how much hatred exists there and how serious they are. Um, so, um, so, yeah, he does. He acts very quickly. Uh, and sends him on his way. Let's go to 25. Somebody read 25 through 30. All right, so um, do you notice anything absent from that letter? Pretty good letter overall, but do you notice something absent from it? He doesn't say anything there about him about to flog a Roman citizen before he finds out. He paints himself in the best picture possible. He says, when I found out, I knew I needed to send him to you. Um, uh, but you also notice something odd about the letter that he sends, um, which is verse 29. They've had two opportunities to state their case, and yet what? I found nothing in this man deserving of imprisonment or anything, and, and yet he's sending him along. I think that's interesting. That's a kind of... A, a little, little um, incongruency in his thinking, right? Uh, but he's ready, I believe, to get Paul out. Let me get Paul away from my territory, out of my area. Let me send him somewhere else. Um, uh, now, Roman law, uh, if in Roman law, if you were to send a prisoner to a different district or jurisdiction, uh, you had to send a letter with the charges laid against the man. And yet, he, he writes verse 29, doesn't he? Um, and so Paul is sent along uh, to Felix, uh, where, where he will be given another trial. Let's go on to verse 31. And in essence, 
became pawns of the Jews. And you'll see that with Felix too, right? He'll do the exact same thing. When we get into chapter 24, and Festus will kind of do the same thing as well. Uh, so you kind of see that over and over again. But again, at the heart of all of this is the providence of God. Right? God is getting Paul where? To Rome. And God will use men's decisions to accomplish his ends. And that's what he's doing. Um, uh, so, yeah, exactly. All right, let's go to 31 through 35. Um, so the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatrius. And on the next day they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. And when they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what providence he was from. And when he learned that he was from um, uh, Caesarea, uh, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium, or palace. Um, so... Uh, you've got Paul, he, he's moved along this some 45, 60 miles in, in a couple of days here. He's come before Felix. Um, uh, now a little bit about Felix. I don't think, I'll go ahead and mention this now. Felix is an interesting character. Uh, he actually is, is in the place of Pilate. Uh, of course, Pilate uh, was, uh, you know, gotten rid of by the emperor, and then uh, Nero has appointed uh, Felix to this post. Uh, Felix is only going to have it about two more years before he'll be replaced by Festus. Uh, Nero will place, replace him. Um, Felix was at, had one, at at one time had been a slave, uh, and now he's a governor. Uh, and so he's really seen a real um, change in life. I mean, going from being a slave to being governor, that's a huge difference. Uh, now, for some, that might humble them in considering how far, how blessed they've been. Others, it may make them arrogant. And that's what happened to Felix. Um, he was a very brutal man and not well liked by, his, uh, by the people. Um, Kaufman, in his commentary, says of uh, Felix, the epithet which history has written by his name, talking about Felix, is this. With savagery and lust, he exercised the powers of a king with the disposition of a slave. And so he was a very arrogant man, uh, very brutal. As I mentioned, he loved power. Uh, and so keep that in mind as we talk about Felix, all that kind of plays into what? happens with him. Uh, but now uh, he has Paul before him and uh, Paul was of course a, a man from his providence and so uh, he says I, I will hear your case. Uh, he puts him in Herod's uh, praetorium or palace. This was, this was a facility uh, built by Herod the Great. Now in the list of Herod's, which one is he? Remember what, what he did? Herod the Great. You should know him. He had the children killed. Yes. So he was the Herod that uh, tried to kill Jesus uh, through the death of uh, the children of Israel. Um, uh, that's that same Herod. This was his praetorium. It was later used by Pilate. Uh, and then, of course, others along after him. Um, and so Paul has now gotten to Caesarea. All right, let's move on to chapter 24. Uh, chapter 24, let's begin there, and we'll read verse 1 as we get started. Now Paul's going to have an opportunity for the third time to have his case heard. Now this time, unlike previous occasions, he will actually have charges laid out against him, and he'll have an opportunity to answer those charges uh, that are laid out against him. Go to verse 1, the text reads, And after five days the high priest Ananias came down with some elders, and a spokesman won Tertullius. And they laid before the governor their case against Paul. 
And so, uh, as, as Claudius had mentioned, um, he had told the Jews, you need to go to Caesarea. There you can, you can lay out your case against Paul, uh, and you can try him. So they do that, and they bring along Tertullius. Now, I don't have a lot of information about him, um, but most likely he's a lawyer. Uh, he's also an or a gifted orator, and this was pretty common practice uh, for that day to, uh, to have a, just like we do in the court system, like if you go, um, uh, if you, go, you had to go to court, what do they always recommend? Get a lawyer, you know. What's the old saying? Anybody remember there's a saying about someone who tries to be their own lawyer? Uh, anybody remember that? Oh, I wish I could have. If I thought about that, I would have looked it up. Uh, there was an old, there's an old saying about one who tries to defend himself in the court of law. He's got a fool for a client. Yeah, that's what it is. He's got a fool for a client because you need professional help is the idea. Um, and so they bring along this man and and as we continue reading, uh, he will lay out the case. Uh, somebody read, if you will, uh, chapter uh, 24, 2 through 8. Not everybody at one time. I only get one reader. I know you are all so eager. So, as Tertullius begins here, what do you notice? What's he trying to do? Sweet talking. Yeah. We've already mentioned Felix is a little bit vain and arrogant. And he's playing to that. I mean, he says some things. Uh, since we enjoyed much peace. That, that was not true. Felix was not a peaceful man. The Jews hated him. But... Of course, you're not going to win a court case if you, if you tell the truth about that stuff. Uh, as I was reading this and listening to it, I said, these Jews was, was really not giving God any kind of glory. And, and they were just looking up to this man as if he was God. That's what stood out at. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they were not as heaven-minded as they should have been. Um, and so they heap on him all kinds of praise, and then they get into the charges they lay out against Paul. So, number one, they say Paul is a plague. Uh, he's a plague on our community. They say that he has stirred up riots. Now, we've mentioned this before, keying on that one, because of all, uh, we mentioned this a lot, rioting, and with Roman law was a bad thing. The Romans hated riots. So remember that one. So they throw that one in there. He started riots. Uh, he was the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. Now, of course, what are they talking about? The way uh, Christians right? the church. Now, during that time, it, this is interesting to note here that Christianity was not seen as something separate from the Jews, even the, from the Roman perspective. They didn't see Christians yet as a separate entity from the Jewish people, right? Uh, the world misunderstood the nature of the church and Christianity and all that, and they just tried to throw them in with, with the Jews. Well, this Jewish person, they didn't see Christians that way. They saw Christians as heretics. But 
they know how the Romans see them. And so you notice he's playing to the Roman view of Christianity. Uh, and so he says he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. And then uh, he, they say that Paul had de desecrated the temple. Now, in all of what Tertullius said, can you pick out the thing that's missing? Think, think for just a minute. Is there something that should be there that's not there? That you would expect in any court of law. Look deeper about what's going on. There's no evidence. They just throw out a bunch of accusations. And nowhere in here do they ever provide any evidence. Now Paul's going to, he's going to key in on this. Now any, any, um, any good um, lawyer, any good prosecutor is going to make sure before he goes into the in, in before a judge, what's he going to have? Witnesses. He's going to have witnesses. He's going to have evidence to prove what he's trying to say. A prosecutor, uh, they don't like to lose. And if, they, if the police department or some entity brings them some kind of charge against somebody, if they don't feel like they can win that case, they're not going to take it most of the time. They need to feel like, I've got the evidence. Well, all they're doing is throwing out accusations. In the next section, we're going to see um, uh, we're going to see Paul's defense. Um, before we move on, also another important thing: of all of those charges, how many of those would, would the Romans really be worried about? Two, right? They gave four. Two of them, they don't care anything about, really. That he was a Roman citizen? Well, number one, they would care about him being a rioter, right? They care about that. And they would care about him starting a new religion. That was two things that were illegal. He couldn't do that. Being a plague to the Jewish people, they really care about the Jews. As long as they keep them at peace, they're okay. And about him desecrating the temple, would they care about the temple at all? If you're a Roman judge, governor? No. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, verse 9 tells us that uh, after Tertullius finished up, the Jews joined, also joined in the charge affirming that all these things were so. And then we get into verses 10 through 21 and we get to see Paul's defense. And I, I'd really like to get this finished up with this before we... Uh, depart. So, somebody read 10 to 21. I know it's a little bit longer. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me, purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. All right, so let's, let's think about what Paul is saying here. Now, what's interesting about Felix, it won't be true of Festus in two years, but what's true of Felix 
and you can go down to verse 22 and see this, is that Felix had some knowledge of Judaism, some basic understanding of it. Now Herod Agrippa, when he comes, he'll have even more, but, but, but Felix does understand Judaism some. And, and, and so um, Paul, Paul says here in verse 10, uh, in speaking to Felix, he says, I am cheerful to make my defense... Why? Because you can, you can verify this stuff. So he said, I'm going to give you evidence, which they didn't. All right? They made accusations. So let's notice real quickly how Paul answers each of these charges laid out against him. And he does it kind of out of order. I'll do it in order and then we'll, we'll talk about it. But number one, was Paul plagued? He says what? He says he could not be a plague on the people of Israel or on the people of Judah. Why? Or Jerusalem? We've been here twelve days. Five of those twelve, I was in custody, so I was only in there for seven days. How can I be a plague? Number two, uh, did Paul stir up riots? Well, um, when they arrested him, what was he doing? He was quietly going about his business in the temple. I wasn't stirring up any riots. They didn't find me in any uh, a tumult or uh, there wasn't any kind of fighting going on or anything like that. Those two charges are just totally baseless. And notice they didn't give any evidence for either of those. Those were their two, or that riot charge was their big one, right? That they're trying to put on him. Um, let me, let me go to four before I go back to three. I've got it up there. I don't order I want to talk about it. But then, what about desecration of the temple? Now, one of the things we know is Rome doesn't care about that anyway. But Paul says, you know, I didn't desecrate the temple. Now, when they originally accused him, what did they accuse him of doing? Do you remember Trophimus? They thought he brought, they assumed wrongly that he brought Trophimus into the temple, which would have been a desecration of the temple under the law of Moses. He didn't do that. And they had no proof of it. And so he said, I didn't desecrate the temple. Now, what about the charge of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene, the, the, the church, right? Now, he actually says, I, did, I, I am guilty of this, in, in this sense. The, the way or the church of Christ is not a sect of the Jews. We're not a sect. However, he did worship God according to the way. But that's not a violation of Roman law. And for the Romans, they wouldn't even view it that way because again, even from their perspective, they don't see Christianity as different or distinct from Judaism. And so Paul answers, uh, answers each of those charges laid out against him. And I think it's also interesting, you can go down to verse 18. Who originally, um, who originally um, charged Paul with doing something wrong? The Sanhedrin? The who? Yeah. It were those from Ephesus and the surrounding areas that had come to Jerusalem and laid that at his feet. And they were the ones who assumed, because they knew who Trophimus was, they're the ones who assumed that Paul brought him into the temple. What's fascinating is, where are they now? They're nowhere to be found. Now, what's one of the key elements? I know this is a different law, but Roman law was very similar in this way. Under our system of law, what does everyone who's been accused have the right to? To face their accusers. If, you, if you're going to make an accusation against somebody, you better be ready to defend that in a court of law. Right? And, and that's one of the staples of, uh, of our governmental system. Why? Why is that important? Number one, they should be the ones with the evidence, right? The proof. But I think there's even a deeper 
reason behind it. Because what's going on is serious. When you talk about violating the law, now human law, of course, is different than law, God's law. That's even more serious. But in human law, I mean, to get charged with a crime, that's serious business. And so Paul had every right to do that. They weren't there. And so he was not allowed to do that. We'll, we'll end here. Um, next week, uh, we almost got to the end, but I just have a little bit here in 24 uh, we'll, we'll catch the end of 24 and then go into 25. Any comments or questions before we end? I got a comment. Yes, I was thinking about how um, the fact that they weren't there. Like, um, at some point, I don't remember exactly where it was, that they ended up, after hearing um, Paul speak, they ended up um, taking sides with Paul. You remember? Because there was a, a division there. And the fact that they weren't there, it would have made, it probably would have, it probably would have, I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking like the fact that they weren't there and they didn't, because of that, that mob mentality, they didn't have an opportunity or a lot of an opportunity for Paul to speak and defend himself. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking. When he was before the Saint Andrew? Yeah, about this accuser why the accuser needs to be present. Yeah. Good comments and questions. Uh, again, we'll, we'll be dismissed now and we'll.